watched films that you wanted to know more. And it may be hard to believe that there was a time before the internet. There, there really was. And so without an internet, you did things like go to the encyclopedia. And I remember about 1961, my parents got us a set of encyclopedias. And I looked, I would sit, you know, for about an hour looking at this little tiny picture of the Alamo in black and white. And now I know that it was Theodore Jean Thiel's drawing of the Alamo. But we wanted to know more, and so we read. And at some point, we learned that, you know, the thing that happened in the movie wasn't really like that. But it didn't make us not like the movie. It made us want to know more about if that didn't happen, what did happen? And so it helped to spawn a whole generation of historians and people with an interest in history that it went beyond the movie. Now, what I like to say about the movie is great movie, bad history. Give you a comparison why this is why this is important, and it goes back to what the filmmakers, you know, what they're trying to do, tell a story. Uh, 2004, Disney had the, the you know the second VM, and Billy Bob Thornton was in it.
there was a restaurant called The Yellow there. We ate there all the time since I was born. And then Walt Disney's Daddy Crockett came out on television and I saw the first two episodes and I loved it. And I was listening to the theme song, Davy Davy Crockett, and they sang that he died in the Alamo. Now, the restaurant in Knobles Road, what was it, bad food or what, you know? So, that's one thing that got me started. And then, of course, John Wayne's movie, Ron Tinkle's book came out, 13 Days to Glory, and that put me in the real world with it. And then Wayne's movie, I found out that it was shot in Brackettville, Texas. It hadn't come out yet. I wrote a letter to an Alamo location in Brackettville, Texas. And a neat man answered, and I'd be shaking. This was in 1960, before the movie premiered. And he sent me photographs of the place and told me all about it. And yes, it was going to be, be there. And by that time, I was 14 and I already knew that movie sets weren't meant to stay, they weren't meant to last. Um, this was unique because Happy Shane wanted this as a place that he could entertain and that people could come and see, and see the Alamo and everything else. So, I was hooked on this guy, and I was hooked on this place. And then the movie opened. And I saw it 13 times in four months. Now this is when you had to go to a movie to see a movie. No internet, no video, no VHS, no. And by 1961, in June, my dad and mother said, let's take the kid down there and get it out of his system. I stand before you. It didn't get out of my system. So, over the years, it just kept getting richer and richer, and I went through Penn State and theater and film production, and interested in movie making because of the Alamo, and then I started to come down and work for Happy Shane in Alamo Village. I did that for four summer, five summers in a row, and then in the 80s I came back down and I've been there ever since. So it's, it is my life, it's a major part of my life, and it's all because of the movies. You know, no, they're not history, they're nothing like history. They're telling a story, they've got to deal with uh, three-act structure, uh, which is a vital thing that interferes with the Alamo, uh, the story of the Alamo. We've got to have a beginning, middle, and end, and the end is either they're all dead, or you go on to San Jacinto, you know, which, which is like another movie. So there are all kinds of issues with making a movie on the Alamo. John Wayne didn't care about that. He just plunged into it. He planned it for 14 years before he finally made it. Uh, he burned all his bridges behind him in Hollywood. He left Republic Studios because the president of Republic wouldn't make the movie the way he wanted it to, the way he wanted to, and he wanted to get this star in it, but not even necessarily star in it. He wanted to produce it and direct it. And Hollywood people were saying, why do you want to do all that? You can't do that. You're not even a very good actor. So he stuck to his guns. Uh, he worked at that for like 14 years and finally did the movie. Against all odds, and I can say a lot about maybe he shouldn't have directed it. You know, maybe John Ford should have directed it. He had the art. John Wayne didn't have the art. He just had the technical knowledge, and he knew how to play to the camera and what to do with all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that was good. But he wasn't an artist to make a work of art. But what he was, and what he did succeed in doing with that movie, was turned it into a passion that everybody that worked with them wouldn't have gone anywhere else and done anything else. They all wanted to be on that train when they got it started. And that brought through an awesome musical score by Dimitri Taylor. How many like that music? Awesome cinematography by William H. Clovier. Uh, you know, just did splendid. A lot of it was based on Remington paintings and Russell paintings and widescreen Todd Ale. Um, Alfred E. Barra doesn't make the sets. And you know, these were all Academy Award nominated situations. The set is something very special because it's state standing, uh, had 
happy he didn't keep it as a monument to John Wayne's The Alamo uh, as much as he did as a movie set where other movies could be filmed. And I, we all kind of feel funny about it sometimes, but as early as publicity, never even had a picture of The Alamo in it on his set. And yet, that wasn't what he thought drew people then to shoot movies there. You know, it was just, it was just a matter of, uh, here we are, we're set, this is what we look like. Gene and Wayne did a big movie here, so come do yours. And as a result, we've done 38 major motion pictures uh, and hundreds of independent commercials and everything. Uh, we have the possibility of a little thing coming up that uh, I can't really talk too much about yet, but uh, it, it, it's still going. The family, unfortunately, Happy Shaham, the man who brought John Wayne here, uh, died in 1996, and his widow, Virginia, died in 2009 or 2010, I guess. So the, the children finally closed the village to the public, uh, and it's, you'll see news reports and everything else that it's not in very good shape right now. But the primary stuff, the John Wayne set, is 90% still there and doing well. And uh, if we have a new lease on life with somebody buying the place, we may get at a, an animal village too. The movie, uh, how many have not seen it? Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but you're about to rectify that. And uh, it's, this, are you gonna, it's going to be here on, on the screen here? Okay, so it's the one for each. And that would be cool. And it's, uh, I was just talking to Ned Huntmaker right here with the camera. And he, I said that I might not stay for the movie when it was outside because I saw what was happening and everything. And uh, as soon as I knew it was going to be in here, I said yes, but I don't know. And Ned said, well, how can you resist not being here for the movie when there are actually people in the room? We've all watched the movie hundreds of times on our TVs and on the best system possible, perhaps. But this is very different, so I'm very much looking forward to it. Well, anybody, anything you want to say or prompt or whatever? Thank you, thank you for the question. Hey. Sam Houston in February 
is off in East Texas making a treaty with the Cherokee. And it's a very important thing for him to be doing, but he's not raising an army. And it's not until he comes back to Washington on the Brazos in early March <laughs> that he's reappointed commander of all Texas forces, and then he sets off to rescue the Alamo. And he sets off to rescue the Alamo on March 6th. Is there a problem? <laughs> and the problem is the Alamo has already fallen. But he gets to Gonzales, which is 70 miles off to the, to the east of us, and he finds about 350 men who have gathered to march off to save the Alamo. But again, the Alamo, they learn, has fallen. So that becomes the nucleus of Houston's army. Now, the, the other thing that, from a historical perspective, I sometimes, when I first came here, I would have people who would say, visitors would come to me and say, they fought harder here because they knew that Goliath, Goliath had fallen and that those men had been massacred. And if you, if you know the chronology of the Texas Revolution, you're like, no, that happened about three weeks after the Battle of the Alamo, where Goliath falls and Fannin's men are then massacred. So, so my idea was, where do they get such a strange idea? And then I happened to be watching a movie at one point, and it's like, it's like, well, like a V8 moment. Where it's like, that's where, they, that's where they're getting it. But, you know, from a movie, from telling a story, you know, it it's, it's kind of punches it up, you know, we've got to fight harder because this happened, but it didn't happen. Now here's the, the main thing to keep in mind, and that is, the name of this movie is, what, The Alamo, and it's, it's such a big event that it tends to overshadow shadow everything else. Where is the, how many of you have seen the movie called Goliath? They haven't made it yet. And it's important because what are the two places that you continually hear about in the Texas Revolution? San Antonio and Goliad. And so what is it about them that is special? And what is special is that they are towns out on the frontier. So they're towns with a, not a lot of things around them. And so that makes them important. And what else makes them important is there are roads that lead to them. And so in the Texas Revolution, Goliad and San Antonio get repeated you know, over and over again because they're important places. And while screen 
And in 2004, again, with that Alamo movie, you know, you become a passive movie goer. So that's what I think they got right. And, and, and probably the, the most brightest scene, the scene that was the most correct in capturing the spirit, is also probably the hokiest. We don't use the word hokey anymore, do we? <laughs> so, so some of you are going, I don't know what hokey means. And, but but it's kind of hokey, and you're looking at it, but nobody talks like that. You know, that's and, and that's John Wayne's scene where he's talking about the Republic. Because historically, that's what this is all about. And so in, in making a movie that somehow is inaccurate with this one scene, you know, they've captured what is actually happening in 1936, this fight over the idea of a Republican, smaller Republican form of government where people get to have a say in their own destiny. And many historians who look at the Alamo movie will say, look at the time that it was made, 1960. This is really a story about the Texans being the Americans and the Mexicans being the Russians. So this is a, kind of a Cold War analogy. And it somewhat works, but again, that speech, even though it's kind of hokey and you go, I wish they would have written it a little different, it, it, if, if John Wayne, as Davy Crockett, said that speech to men at the Alamo, they would understand it and agree with what he was saying. Do you have anything to, to add? Have you got anything to add? <laughs> So, at this time, if you've got any questions, if you feel moved by the Spirit to say something,
talk about the film. I'd like to see that. I mean, literally, I can take the facts and make them more ready. What you're talking about is, is filmmakers putting their their personal beliefs, sometimes their political beliefs in movies. And, and I'm sure that when you look at the movies that Wayne made in the 60s, especially when you go to like something like The Green Berets, and, and what do we think about when we think about John Wayne? You know, he's, he's sort of the, the ultimate American. And, and yes, there's, I think there is some of that in there. Yeah. I think the like this too, yeah. This one's from Texas. If you're talking, this particular call has a feature of magnifying, so... So what we're talking about is is yes, I think Wayne did put his some of his own beliefs into it, but at that time it was the beliefs of not just Wayne, but but of many Americans would have had that same view, I think. Perhaps you could add that, okay? I, come up and for the Alamo. Uh, I corresponded with Lon Tinkle at one point, I think it was in his seventies before he died, fortunately. And uh, do you know who Lon Tinkle was? He was the author of the book Thirteen Days to Glory. During the filming of the movie, John Wayne had Lon Tinkle and J. Frank Doby on the set uh, a lot of times. And these guys were awesome historians in their own right. And my question to Doby, I mean to Lon Tinkle in the letter was, hey, if you were on the set, why wasn't the movie more accurate? And he said, because they wouldn't listen to anything I had to say. <laughs> well, okay, the time to influence a movie is at the screenplay stage, not once they're shooting, because once they're shooting, it's extremely expensive to make changes, so I understand that and I'm sure he didn't very well, but he went a little farther. He said that James Edward Grant, who was the screenwriter in the film, uh, was, had some money invested in the movie. He was an associate producer, so he had a lot of clout in the film. And he said, this is Lon Tinkle's words, he said, I have rarely met a man who had more contempt for what the general public could be induced to accept as fact. So this was the man who wrote John Wayne's screenplay. But John Wayne loved his writing. He wrote good dialogue, he wrote good stories for the Alamo. So that's where, where John Wayne's movie came from. He used and abused historians. He'd have them on the set uh, and use them for publicity, but then they, they had their name taken off the film. By, by the same token, uh, the 2004 film, as you know, Steve Harden and Alan Huffines were historians on it. Uh, and the approach on that film with the director, John Lee Hancock, was, I don't want to make any decisions out of ignorance. I may make a choice that you don't agree with, but I want to hear everything you have to say first. And that's the new difference with, with making more historical movies versus just telling a damn good story.